All right. So first of all, what's what's a generative model in comparison to what a discriminative model is? Uh, we've it's pretty common to to see uh, references to generative models as, but but no. There, there are in my at least in my experience coming more in personally from the KR side of things, there aren't um, uh, a lot of explanation, clear explanations on what generative models are actually uh, after. So it's it's commonly assumed to be something that's you know everybody knows, and at least in my case, I haven't I haven't seen clear explanations. So I went out and looked for them and and, and built a few introductory slides to share. The, the first one, discriminative models are the most common ones, at least in classification. I'm, I'm talking in, 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 in the realm of classification tasks. Discriminative models are pretty simple. They wish, they, they seek to, to establish what's called a decision boundary to separate classes of interest. So here we see, you know, green dots belonging to dogs, uh, blue dots belonging to cats. They're not involved. They don't seek to actually describe the elements or the classes themselves. They just say, you know, from from this point uh, on, like over to, to that side of the space, you have uh, class A, and the other on the other side you have class B, and that's all they want. So to to discriminate between two two or more classes. Generative models, again, for, for classification, um, all generative models build probability distributions based on the classes and features. So they, in, in comparison to, to discriminative uh, models, they do provide information regarding the contents of, of each class. And in particular, what's interesting is this capability here. So they have, once you have um, the, what what was learned from from the model, which is a probability distribution, you can sample from those probability distributions and thus generate elements. So that's where the name comes from. You can generate elements based on the probability distribution. So this, in, in particular, this figure isn't that helpful in the sense that you know it's not quite clear what what it's conveying you know it's it's just you know carving out part of the space and saying here are the dogs and here are different kinds of dogs and um or cats but it's not conveying specifically what's going on so i i like this graph a little bit better this this um this illustration because you can see exactly what's going on with the goal so you're trying to here directly estimate the probability that some unseen data will belong to to one of the two classes. So you're saying, uh, what's the probability of my observation given that it's in, the, in class A or class B? And you know, examples are um, typical things like SVMs or regression regression uh, based classification, where um, generative models they estimate a probability distribution to deduce the same thing that the, the decision boundary was was giving you before. So what you're learning, in, instead of learning this, this boundary, you're actually learning the probability distributions of the data. One of the most well-known um, techniques for this is naive Bayes, of course, where you just you, you end up learning a probability distribution and then you can um, use it for the same kind of task here, but you can also generate elements based on these distributions. So this assumes, so generative models assume that the world behaves kind of like this. So that there's some sort of true model provided, you know, by the world. It's, this, is, this is what we're trying to learn. And then what you come up with is a data generating process that then you can just use to generate data. So it's it's often useful in in AI and data science to think about the world in, in this way. So the the true model is the phenomenon that you're investigating that you hope to understand, and then the the gen the data generating process is comprised of real world mechanisms that create the data. So and and you can record if if you want, and that is precisely what generative models seek to learn. There are two pretty well-known examples that um, I that we'll be uh, illustrating here. The first one is 
Markov chains. So you've probably run into this model. I have in another window here, um, there, uh, an illustration of this actually um, in, in, in a dynamic uh, example. So Markov chains, they, they're they essentially sets, sequences of uh, random variables that describe some sort of dynamic process. So in this case, you can see, um, you can move speed here, you can make it uh, uh, faster or slower, but you can see that the, um, the system is going between two states. So it can either stay in state A or transition to state B or the same thing symmetrically. So what I wanted to show you here is here, if you want, you can change the probability. So if you want uh, it to be the, the most common, most uh, probable thing is to, for, the, for the system to stay in state A, you can see that there's a 10% chance of transitioning and you can do the same thing here. So what's interesting about this is that they're, uh, they can model, uh, so if these states were rainy or sunny in, in, for, for weather, is you can simulate this, and that is actually uh, a Markov chain used as a de data generating process. So we can see here that what we're sampling is actually um, from, from this process. So this is generating data based on, on the process. Here we, we can see, you see the S's that are being generated, and then the, the, the rain, the sun. So I think it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting um, way to, to actually see, see these things working. So if you want to play with this, you'll, you'll have the, the link in, in the slides. The other one is, of course, much more well known. I think, well, not, I don't know if much more, but it's, it's a more of a, a generative model called uh, generative adversarial networks or GANs. So these were uh, developed several years ago and have shown a lot of um, applications in, in, in in the real world uh, domains. And the way they work is that they have, they're divided into two, um, two models. One is, is a generator. So you can have random, it uses random input. Uh, so kind of like random noise to, to work with, with this. It generates what's called fake examples because they're not, they, they're trying to, to compete with actual real real world examples that you would use for um, for training, and then you have the discriminator, which tries to see if they can discriminate between real examples and um, the fake ones that are being generated. So, in in this case, it, it just says you know real versus, versus fake, and then based on this performance, the generator will try and adjust. Um, its its performance. I also have um, so this is an animation of of what's going on. We can see this working in um, in a second. So it's trying to sample um, the the purple ones are are fake are fake samples, and the the green ones are the real ones. And it, you can see how it adapts. So this is just a a, a short animation seeing how it eventually gets much closer, but we can also go back here and see, let's refresh this. And you can play with, um, you can select the distribution that you want to learn. So either you have this, this straight line to two kind of blobs, uh, the ring, or, or just a few, you know, different, uh, uh, spots of, of data there. So let's, let's go with the ring. I think it's a pretty uh, interesting one. And then here, if you click here, you can also make the, the generator have more, more neurons. It'll be more, a little bit more capable. It's, I think it works better if it has more neurons. And then if you make it run, so you, you'll see that the purple dots are being sampled, trying to imitate the, um, 
the target distribution, but all they have to work with is a loss function based on how well the discriminator is um, is being able to detect real versus fake. So the discriminator is, is trained already with with the uh, with the real data, and the generator is trying to fool it. Here, the, this visualization is also showing you the the, the points where where the um, the gradients are. So this point here needs to move that way to 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 be closer to um, to performing better. So this is pretty. It's pretty slow. So it's running. Um, it's running locally, I, I believe, and it's it doesn't always work. Um, doesn't always reach the 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 um, the best result very quickly. But I think it's a really nice thing to to play with and to illustrate what's what's going on. And, and again, you can change a lot of uh, you know the optimizers, learning rates, uh, different kinds of noise here. So I think it's a pretty pretty interesting tool. All right. So that's the, the GAN lab. So generative models, of course, we've probably all seen these, these kinds of, um, of applications. So these are random in images. I think this is, yeah, this comes from um, those, those websites. This something does not exist. In this case, it's this speech does not exist. These are um, random Im images generated by um, generative models. Basically saying, you know, generate me some some beach, you know, and and in general they they work very well in certain domains, not so well with um, with uh, human hands. In that case, we've seen a lot of um, of limitations in that sense, but it, they they are getting better, so they are they are pretty powerful. Um, other examples are audio being generated here. In this case, I think based on I think the top one is from, um, I think it's Meta or Microsoft, I'm not sure, but it's it based on, on textual input, it generates um, different uh, musical beats and melodies and that kind of thing. Of course, uh, chat GPT or the, the GPT uh, 3, 4 um, tools. And also, um, I think this is Adobe, where you can add, you can uh, edit images basically with just with, with prompts and uh, generative fills and that kind of thing. So this goes way, way beyond the, the very simple things that I was just showing you. Is just wanted to, to show you how powerful they are for certain applications. But, you know, going back to, to the, the author of, of this book that I was telling you about and, and the this uh, these comments by by the author so he he was discussing in this in this um in this article um this experience he had where uh i don't know why some person was trying to use chat gpt to um essentially impersonate him and saying why he wrote the original book and and the the person you know, sent him this and said, and said, hey, can I publish this? Are, are you okay? And he he was frankly appalled. He was saying that it doesn't didn't sound anything like him. That it was just you know some uh, some fluffy hand waving kind of, of thing. Even though it sounded very well, you know, to to the uh, to the random reader that didn't know uh, what uh, Hofstadter sounds like. So, but I liked a couple of quotes here saying, well, if I'm frankly baffled by the allure for so many unquestionably insightful people, including uh, many friends, of letting opaque computational systems perform intellectual tasks for them. Of course, it makes sense to let a computer do, do obviously mechanical tasks such as computations, but when it comes to using language in a sensitive manner and talking about real life situations where distinction between truth and falsity and between genuineness and fakeness is absolutely crucial. To me, it makes no sense whatsoever to let the artificial voice of a chatbot chatting randomly away at dazzling speed replace the far slower but authentic and reflective voice of a thinking human, living human being. 
So I I highlighted a, a, a few of the of, of the terms here. I like this real life situations where you have to distinguish be, between truth and falsity. I think this is one of the the crucial limitations of these models where they're just tr training to to be able to repeat what um, what they've seen in the training data, and um, they really have no no grounding, and that's why I'm, I'm making so, so such a, a a point here in this in this lecture. There's no grounding um, with any actual um, notion of truth in the world. So they're just essentially um, parroting away, you know, with based on on these distributions. Where it, it works really well for things like you know, generate a beach or something that that has no impact on 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 the, the ground truth of the world. But when you want to actually ask them about something it often makes a lot of mistakes. So um, the second one is um, to fall for the illusion that computational systems who uh, have never had a single experience in the real world outside of text are nevertheless perfectly reliable authorities about the world at large is a deep mistake. And he warns, if that mistake is repeated sufficiently often and comes to be widely accepted, it will undermine the very nature of truth on which our society, in my, I mean, all of human society is based. So it's pretty intense what he's saying, but I, I think he's right in the sense that you really have to uh, treat these models uh, as being very useful for certain things, like I was just saying, but for others, they're really, uh, frankly, out, out of their depth.